here today with Matt Tremblay, Senior Vice President, Global Offshore for the American Bureau of Shipping, ABS. Uh, ABS convened a meeting in New Orleans today on the offshore energy market. And Matt, first and foremost, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Greg. Happy to be here. I think you can speak better than I that there is incredible interest in offshore wind and its impact on the entirety of the U.S. maritime market. When you look at the offshore wind opportunity today, what do you see? There's a lot of opportunities and a lot of growth uh, available in, in the market that we're going to experience as, a, as an industry over the next four years, five years, ten years. Uh, the, the question isn't so much uh, how much growth is there going to be, but how fast is that growth going to happen? And how much of the capacity that's there available in the existing market is there both on the design side, the construction side, the operation side of this business within the United States to, to support that growth uh, along a timeline that is going to support the investor's desire for uh, the, these projects to be commissioned over the next decade. Okay. Um, timelines and challenges obviously were a main point of discussion here today. Uh, so when you look at the challenges faced to getting this market up to speed, up to scale, what do you see today as the main challenges? Yeah, the biggest challenge are around the, the industry is, is the investment decisions around the, the vessels that are going to be supporting you know, the installation and operations uh, of offshore wind in the United States. You know, we're for, for installation vessels, for, for uh, SOVs, we're looking at investments of $300 million, $100 million that are very, very hard to make on spec. You, you don't want to take a lot of risk in, a, in an emerging market with investment numbers uh, that high. And uh, having a, a, uh, uh, an investment decision and a, and a, a contract that's going to support that investment to get that, that uh, investment from the banks and, and the the, uh, the, the financial support a project investment like this would need is, is very difficult when uh, we're, we're still in the infancy stages of, of many of these bigger projects getting sanctioned. And, and as the, uh, the first few projects get going and as the industry and the installation offshore ramps up, I think this, this problem will slowly uh, work itself out. But at this stage right now, it's, it's, uh, you're looking at vessels that have you know, 24, 36 month construction periods uh, that uh, that are, are very hard to, to, to look at as a investment opportunity on spec. And uh, getting those first few contracts going, I think, is going to be one of the, the, the biggest hurdles for us to overcome to really start seeing the, the exponential growth in the, in the market. Yeah, I think one of the great points brought up today is it's not just the construction cycle, but also the, the design cycle, the contracting cycle, and it starts to start, it starts to move out quite rapidly. That's that's true. That that you know, 30, 35 month uh, construction period for a for a high spec uh, installation vessel, um, you know that that you have to consider a couple of months of negotiation on contracts on both ends. You know, give yourself an extra half a year for for some more engineering. Mm -hmm. You know, all of a sudden you're looking more than more than four years out uh, when you're you're trying to plan ahead for when am I going to need this asset? Okay. Well, obviously today we're still. Uh, in the throes of an offshore oil and gas downturn, uh, and there are a lot of vessels that are sitting idle. When you look at the market today, obviously uh, vessel owners, once, a, once their ship's working, uh, when you look at the potential for offshore wind, is there a possibility to take some of those idle vessels and convert them for this uh, use, or do you see this strictly as a new build market? You know, looking at the, the needs of the, the wind farm installation and, and support vessels and, you know, what those vessels are, are built like and designed like in, in Europe and, and throughout the rest of the world and the, and the projects we've seen in the U.S., you know, while we would like to see there an opportunity to, to get some greater utilization out of these, these OSVs that have been somewhat stranded for the last few years, uh, it, it really is likely that uh, most of these, these vessels are going to have to be specifically designed new-built vessels to support the unique aspects, uh, technical aspects of the, the function they're going to have to serve. So, you know, while I, I more than anybody, I'd love to see a lot of these boats going back to work, uh, there's not a lot of opportunity to, to retrofit a lot of the existing tonnage in the U.S. to, uh, to serve this emerging market. Okay. Um Obviously, there's a lot of uh, trends today. 
Uh, we're at a transcendent time in maritime history uh, with a lot of the new emission regulations, uh, the digitalization on ships. When you look at the new emerging technology sweeping in the maritime industry, how does this play into the growth that you see in the offshore wind sector? You know, this is a place where we are able to take advantage of the things that we're learning in the, in the offshore sector, specifically, you know, the OSV market, and apply a lot of that existing or, or newly emerging technology to the, the vessels that are going to be operating in offshore wind. Uh, you know, one example is, is uh, hybrid power systems that can be used that we've seen a lot of success in the OSV market over the last few years in the installation of battery and hybrid power systems to uh, increase the efficiency of, of uh, vessels operating in the, in the Gulf of Mexico and around the world. As well, you know, the application of new digital technologies, you know, opportunities to utilize tools like Digital Twin for asset integrity management, uh, as well to support uh, other operating characteristics as far as vessel optimization. I think the, the possibilities that, that we see starting to come out of the, the offshore industry on the MODUs, on the, on the FPSOs even, uh, as well as on the OSVs, there's a lot of those similar types of technologies that we could apply to these same vessels to uh, take a, a, a marginally smaller uh, uh, capex and uh, result in hopefully a, a, a pretty good OPEX return over the next 20 years of the vessel life. Um, I mean, I've been doing this for 28 years, and I think I've seen class become uh, ever more a remit of technical expertise for, uh, for vessel owners. Um, I'm assuming that you're getting a lot of questions today from vessel owners that want to be involved in this market. Uh, can you share with us some of the, the, the main questions that you are receiving? Yeah, class really has changed from uh, when I started in, in class 23 years ago. Class was a uh, uh, an entity that provided a class certificate, and, mm -hmm. and that was really it. And uh, these days, uh, class has really become a resource of technical expertise and uh, advisory services around uh, uh, OPEX optimization, around design optimization, uh, around uh, uh, risk management. And uh, a lot of the questions that we're getting uh, in that area from the, the wind market are, are tied to many of those similar things that we work with uh, all the maritime and offshore industry on. So areas such as uh, design optimization opportunities within the, uh, the drivetrain and the power system to uh, hull design optimization to uh, the conceptual approval of new technologies as they're utilized either because they've been invented or because they're being moved from one industry to another, for example, into the maritime industry where they haven't been before. Uh, we have crane technologies, we have walk-to-work gangways, we have uh, different digital tools that are now being installed on board assets uh, that they really haven't had a lot of experience on prior to the last 10 years. And, and class is being relied upon to verify that these new technologies, as they're implemented more and more quickly, we're identifying what the risks are related to those new, uh, new technologies being used in new ways. And that you know, we're meeting the mission of classification of helping keep these assets safe and these operators safe, these workers safe offshore, as well as protecting the environment that they work in. The growth potential for this market will also have an, an impact on ABS itself. Sure. Uh, can you share with me how ABS is changing or envisioning changing uh, to meet this growing demand? You know, ABS as an organization is, is uh, uh, a large globally distributed company that, that has the ability to, to you know, take on new activities like this uh, all the time. But, you know, the, the things that we're doing around uh, preparing the company for, um, you know, the growth of the wind market, uh, especially in the in the U.S. and, and areas outside of uh, Europe, where it's, where it's pre previously been, is, of course, a number of uh, internal training activities, but as well, uh, writing new rules, guidance notes, uh, developing technology uh, guides and, and working in uh, joint industry projects, joint development projects to help support the industry with our technical expertise as the, the larger industry, the designers, the shipyards, the owners, et cetera, are, are building their own technology portfolios, you know, making sure that the, the breadth of technical knowledge that ABS has is available through a number of different methods mm -hmm. to, to the industry such as joint projects, such as writing new rules and guides, and uh, making sure that, that we are making our expertise available, as well as continuing to do our own internal R&D 
and investing back into ABS and, and making sure that we are always the most technically capable uh, organization to support the development of the industry. As a ship owner um, interested in the offshore wind market, what should I be doing to prepare today? Uh, I mean, there's a number of activities, but firstly, it's it's preparing yourself for, you know, what's different in uh, operating in this this OCS, this Outer Continental Shelf environment, than you would be in, you know, a normal transportation type of uh, uh, marine uh, business environment. Uh, as well, start having those conversations very early with your regulators, class, the Coast Guard, uh, or whatever other flag state you're dealing with uh, to make sure that you have a, a true understanding of what the regulatory challenges are that may be different from what you're from what you're used to and then as well you know starting to work out what your own you know business risk profile is in the first place as as you're moving into an emerging industry uh, making sure that you're prepared and, and and fully understand you know what the uh, risks are in this industry versus uh, in the wind industry and the wind support industry as opposed to uh, where you may have been operating in and for example an OSV or a, a, a crew boat market in the past obviously Matt uh, safety is job one for anybody working in the energy market especially and, and ABS especially right. well it, it Particularly, it's it's always been uh, the highest regard in the offshore oil and gas right. market. Um, in looking at this new emerging market, can you just give an overview of the importance of safety, particularly for perhaps a new uh, a new group of yeah. workers that's not perhaps not as used to working in the offshore environment. Right, especially in the in the market of the, you know, the U.S. OCS has had a, a, a strong culture built, safety culture built over the last 50 years. And, and you know, it's ABS's mission to, to support that. But, you know, in, in bringing a, a new type of industry to the uh, U.S. offshore market, uh, we bring a, a new group uh, of offshore workers to the market as well. Uh, that are a little bit different than the, the guys that have been working on the, the oil rigs, working on the OSVs and crew boats. Uh, the, the technicians that are, are working on these uh, offshore wind turbines are, are very specialized uh, technical uh, technicians and, and they're not necessarily guys who grew up in the oil patch mm -hmm. that are used to uh, working in the oil patch environment. So, you know, a lot of the, the vessels and, and uh, support vessels that are being built today are, are being built with that in mind. Mm -hmm and looking at you know what's unique to these these individuals what unique training they may have what unique training they may need and what unique aspects of the vessel design may need to be added as opposed to you know something that may be in a more simple uh, crew boat uh, we may be able to uh, or may need to you know put a little more design consideration into the accommodations areas the working areas on board these these uh, SOVs as opposed to the uh, the OSVs that we've been used to managing in the United States. Well, Matt, again, I appreciate your time. Very busy, and Thanks it's uh, always good to visit with yeah, you. It's great to see you again, too. Okay.